dans cet exposé, nous posons In this presentation, we are going to discuss uh, Belter's theory. We'll talk about the airfoil, the lift-to-drag ratio, and we will talk about aerodynamic torque. Albert Betz was a German physicist in 1990, introduced a theory according to which we can calculate the wind power that is caught by the wind turbine. If we place an obstacle in an airflow, the obstacle slows down the air, the air velocity. And if it is a wind turbine, uh, behind the wind turbine downstream of it, the wind velocity will be lower than before the windmill. Here we have the speed V2, which is comprised between uh, 0 and V1. But the two extremes are impossible because if V2 is equal to V1, it means there is no wind turbine, there is no uh, recovered out, uh, energy, and if V equals 0, the windmill cannot rotate. No energy is recovered. Belsa's theory consists in finding what is the exact value, wind value behind the windmill in order to recover maximum power. We can also notice that because of uh, flow conservation, the input uh, flow is the same as the uh, output flow. The virtual wind tube's area increases uh, from the upstream to the downstream, and it has the bottleneck, the shape of a bottleneck. Belsa's theory allows to obtain a maximum power Sorry, Belsa's theory indicates that in order to obtain the maximum power on the rotor, the wind behind the windmill should be one-third of the wind before the windmill, which gives us a maximum power of approximately 16 27 of the uh, wind power, 0.59 times the wind power, Belsa's uh, power. An ideal windmill should be able to recover only 59% of the wind's power. In summary, when, when it uh, approaches a uh, windmill, will slow down from V1 to two-thirds of V1, and at the back of the windmill, it be, will be one-third of the upstream power. So we can capture maximum power in an ideal windmill, Belts' power points 59 times the wind power, half of rho SV1 cubic. Surface will increase progressively from the upstream to the downstream uh, area, and we see the bottleneck effect. Just so that you understand, we uh, have uh, drawn here graphs of the uh, wind power and Belsa's power for a surface of one square meter with a uh, volume, uh, mass volume of 1.25. And when the wind changes from uh, from wind one kilometer per hour to 100 kilometer per hour, we see that the wind power changes uh, by a few from a few uh, milliwatts to more than 13 kilowatts. Belt's power, 0.59 times the wind power, will vary from a few milliwatts to approximately 8 kilowatts, which would be enough to uh, supply power to one house if the uh, windmill is perfect and the wind blows permanently at 100 kilometers per hour. Now, let us compare an urban windmill with a power windmill for a wind at 70 kilometers per hour. We calculated Belt's power if uh, the two windmills are perfect. The urban wind mill with one square meter of surface could uh, recover 2.75 kilowatts. If we have a big power uh, windmill with a 30 meter long blade, uh, we would have 7.8 megawatts of power, enough to supply power to more than 1,500 houses. Next question. Why do the blades rotate? There are three types of windmills, horizontal axis and vertical axis. All the horizontal axis uh, uh, windmills function according to the airfoil principle. And also the Darius vertical axis uh, windmill functions operates the same way. However, the Savonius system with a vertical axis is uh, based on the uh, differential drag principle. Before I explain the uh, airfoil notion, I would like to spend a few seconds on Bernoulli's law. In a uh, watering hose, the, the uh, flow conservation 
principle says that the uh, flow is the same along the tube. If the cross-section is the same at input and output, the same quantity of water will come out. But if we pinch the uh, tube, we reduce the cross-section and we increase the speed. Bernoulli's law states that in a current line, Total pressure is constant. Total pressure is the sum of local pressure, small p, and dynamic pressure, half of a rho SV square. If this sum is constant, small p plus a constant speed, if the speed increases locally, pressure decreases. So where the tube is pinched, there will be low pressure, a vacuum. This is the whole principle of the Venturi tube, a tube in the middle of which there is a uh, smaller cross-section, the uh, speed will increase, uh, and a vacuum will be created in the middle. If there is a small hole there, there will be suction. A few domestic applications of the uh, principle, the Bernoulli principle, for instance, if we uh, have a perfume uh, vaporizer, if we push the pump, the speed in the, horizon the horizontal tube increases and there is a vacuum uh, bringing the uh, perfume up. We find the same law in static extractors for chimneys. Due to the shape, there is a pinching in the middle and the wind that blows in the tube, accelerates in the middle, creating a vacuum that drags the uh, smoke gases out. And the same goes when you have a hot water shower. Locally, the speed increases, uh, thus creating a vacuum, and the uh, vacuum will suck the, uh, the curtain onto the uh, person having a shower. And also we have the coanda effect. If we place a uh, teaspoon, uh, the round side of a teaspoon, the bulging side in a water jet, due to the uh, rounded shape, the bulging shape, the speed will increase locally, creating a vacuum, holding the, the teaspoon in the water jet. Now, let us look at a uh, an airplane wing with a, an asymmetric uh, cross-section, and if we place it in an airflow, we see that the uh, wing, the airplane wing, will disrupt the airflow locally. The speed above the air wing increases because of the uh, flow conservation law, and uh, therefore pressure decreases. If we take two air molecules on the attack edge of the wing, the one that goes above will uh, have a longer travel and will go faster than the one at the uh, bottom in order to meet at the end. There is local speed increase above an air wing and vacuum. The vacuum tends to drag the wing profile upwards, and this is the reason why planes take up. We understand that uh, vacuum forces above the wing will be greater than the uh, pressure forces under the wing. A few things you need to know about the profile. The attack edge is the one at the front, uh, the trail edge is the one at the end, and the distance between the two is uh, also called the cord line, the uh, upper surface and the lower surface are also to be considered. Now, if wind arrives on the uh, wing with an I incidence versus the profile axis, the airflow going above the wind will gather speed and create a vacuum generating a uh, lift force and the lift coefficient is CZ, CZ and there will be a, a sustentating uh, effort. And if we place something in the airflow, this will cause a uh, drag force, and the drag force is Cx. When the profile is uh, symmetric, we see that if small i equals zero, the two courses up and below on top and below the wing are the same, so the uh, lift force and the trail force uh, are equal and the lift force is zero. We understand the same thing on the next graph. How do we obtain this? Either we use uh, wind tunnels uh, or virtual uh, wind tunnels uh, on the internet, and if the incidence angle is zero, lift is uh, low and there is zero and there is very little trail, 
And if we increase the incidence, if we reach an incidence angle that is common to all profiles, 10 to 12 degrees, lift will drop and uh, drag will increase uh, strongly. And this is because the boundary lines uh, go above the profile, causing a vortex. This is very bad for an airplane if that should happen, because the airplane will simply crash to the ground. But for wind blades, this uh, property is used to slow down the uh, windmill rotor. Before we close, these pictures show you the vortexes above a windmill blade or an airplane wing. Very close to the stalling point, we see the vortexes being uh, caused when we go above the stalling angle. Thank you.